thanks everyone for joining. Um, it's my great honor and pleasure uh, to host the 14th uh, Industry Spotlight, uh, which is sponsored by Corporate Liaison Program and, uh, uh, and also um, Computer Society Chapter of Santa Clara Valley Section. Um, and uh, we have a number of program committee members of, of this committee. Uh, I will ask Paolo to introduce our speaker today. Uh, please hold your uh, questions till the end. You can also type them dynamically as you go into the chat. Uh, and uh, Paolo will moderate at the end and, and ask the questions. Perhaps you can also ask verbally. So with all uh, uh, further ado, Paolo, please introduce our guest. Yes, hi, uh, my name is Paolo Ferabowski and I have a great pleasure to introduce Gabe Law for this talk. Uh, I think I've known Gabe for probably close to 20 years by now, which you know, I guess dates both of us, although he is a lot younger than, than I am. <clears throat> uh, but um, when uh, he was a, in the faculty of Georgia Tech, and right now Gabe is a senior fellow in AMD research. And uh, previously he received his PhD and master from Yale University in computer science. And uh, as I mentioned, he was a professor at uh, Georgia Tech before joining AMD around 2011, I guess. He has a numerous amount of uh, recognition and awards. I'm not gonna read all of them. He's a fellow of ACM and IEEE and uh, was a recipient in 2018 of the prestigious uh, Morris Wilkes Award for his contribution on 3D stacked memory and in general computer architecture. Um, so again, I'm, I'm very excited to hear what uh, Gabe will have to say today. Um, he's going to talk about an overview of the chiplet technology in a recent AMD processor. So uh, Gabe, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks a lot. All right. So, you know, who needs more performance? You know, we, we all want more performance. I don't think there's uh, any real uh, you know, controversial question about that. But it's you know, one of those things that if you look back, you know, over time, looking into the future, uh, the demand for more and more performance just isn't slowing down. Um, you know, we're, we're many, many uh, years away from, you know, 640K of memory and everything else. Uh, but, you know, just a, a couple quick, you know, motherhood and apple pie uh, examples. Um, if you look at, you know, kind of the HPC space over you know, the last several decades, you look at the highest performing supercomputers and you know, they've just been on this incredible exponential trend. And if you actually look at, you know, the rate uh, over time, we're seeing a doubling in the performance capabilities of the highest end supercomputers every about 1.2 years. And that's, you know, quite impressive when you think about the standard Moore's law rate of like a doubling of capability every, you know, 18 to 24 months, right? So you know, this has actually been going at a, at a rate faster than the raw silicon technology uh, would provide you. And there's this very exciting time. We're on the cusp of, you know, the, the first exascale uh, supercomputers in the world. And, you know, from all of the discussions with, you know, various government agencies and uh, other groups, the demand doesn't seem to be uh, going anywhere. Um, and just, you know, uh, it's now, uh, in, in this day and age, you have to mention machine learning in any uh, talk. It's a, uh, I think it's a contractual requirement at this point. Um, and if you look at, you know, the growth of the machine learning you know, models over time, it's also just been uh, perhaps even, even more ridiculous. The, you know, the largest models these days are, you know, have already passed the trillion parameter uh, threshold. And, you know, some of the estimates are saying that the amount of compute required for, you know, training these models is doubling every, you know, three to four months, uh, you know, which is, you know, significantly faster even than, you know, the, the first chart showing the HPC trends. Uh, so, you know, hopefully, you know, with this crowd, uh, no one is going to uh, take much, uh, you know, uh, have much against uh, the claim that you know we're going to need more and more performance uh, going forward, uh, at least for quite a while yet. So, what's you know stopping us? Okay, so again, for this crowd, hopefully this is not any sort of uh, major news, but you know it's been long reported for some time now that you know Moore's law is you know coming to an end, is dying, is dead. Um, and, you know, for the longest time, you know, it's, it's you know, that hasn't been a, a new claim, right? Uh, for those who have been around long enough, we, we've heard, you know, uh, the, the chicken little sky is falling about the end of Moore's law, you know, many, many times. 
over the years. But you know, this time it does appear things are in fact you know slowing down. Uh, this chart shows you know from our own uh, internal uh, projections and estimates on you know, when the different technology nodes have come out over time. And you know, we saw that going from you know 90 nanometers down to about 22, you know, we saw that nice steady cadence that you know Moore's law traditionally had predicted. Uh, however, going from 22 to 14, you know, at that point we did see an extension in you know the the, the internode you know, arrival time, uh, and then going you know beyond 14 to the next node after that, we saw an extension more. And so you know this is really showing that you know Moore's law you know, indeed is, is slowing down. You know the the long uh, predicted, uh, you know, future is, is now. And this is, you know, on one hand, perhaps, you know, not horrible, you know, it's not great, but, you know, what this basically would say is that if we want greater computational capabilities, you know, we might have to wait a little bit longer than we are traditionally used to, but, you know, so long as we can get to that next node, we can build machines with greater capabilities, solve bigger problems. At the same time, Unfortunately, what we're also seeing is that the cost of the silicon, you know, and the, uh, the leading node is going up over time. So not only are we having to wait longer to get that new capability that, you know, uh, increased transistor density, but when we finally get there, we actually have to pay more for it. Uh, you know, one of the you know, really powerful aspects of, you know, classic Moore's law was not just that we got more transistors over time, but that you know, to a first order, the cost you know, for a wafer was, you know, about constant, which meant that, you know, generation after generation, the cost per transistor was also, you know, exponentially decreasing. And so, you know, one could view Moore's law as both a technology statement, but in some sense, also an economic statement. Um, you know, this chart, however, is showing that, you know, that economic factor, you know, is breaking down, has broken down. Um, and so, you know, not only are we waiting longer to get that uh, increase in device capability, when we get there, it costs us more than it had in the past. So, you know, this puts a lot of pressure, a lot of challenges on, you know, trying to deliver that performance that our, you know, that the applications that the end users uh, are demanding going forward. You know, we talk about, you know, the silicon technology, but, you know, there's a lot more that goes into building uh, a, a modern, you know, processor, a, a modern uh, system on chip. Uh, so, you know, in addition to just, you know, the raw materials, there's uh, incredible engineering design costs. You know, these designs are getting more and more complex. There's, you know, tens of billions of transistors in these systems, um, you know, often, uh, you know, perhaps viewed by some as, you know, less uh, glamorous, but, you know, the verification uh, is a monumental engineering task for all of these designs and, you know, consumes uh, significant engineering resources in uh, any of these projects. Uh, and, you know, people do talk about, you know, some of the other, you know, non-recurring costs like mass sets that are, you know, uh, exploding costs due to the, the difficulty of cutting edge lithography requiring, you know, things like you know, multi-patterning and whatnot. So before we get into the, uh, you know, the topic of uh, chiplets uh, in this talk, you know, um, just a sort of baseline uh, assuming, you know, I, I don't know exactly what the, the breadth of uh, knowledge of the audience is, so I wanna make this a, a little bit more accessible. I'll talk you know, briefly about you know, just how manufacturing, you know, uh, silicon manufacturing uh, traditionally works you know, in a pre-chiplet uh, fashion. Right? And this is gonna be a you know, very high level a cartoon uh, type of approach, right? So we typically start with a you know, silicon wafer and upon that wafer, you'll uh, you know, perform your lithographic steps to you know, make multiple chips, right? And from that, we'll get you know, some number of uh, the silicon dye. Uh, once you have these dye, you have to go through some sort of testing. You know, it's not a perfect process. So some of them you know, may have manufacturing defects. Uh, when you detect this, you have to take them, throw them in a trash bin. And unfortunately, that's you know cost that has to be burdened by the remaining parts, right? I, I pay a certain amount for this wafer, and if I get fewer working parts, uh, that's fewer um, you know products I can sell and have to amortize uh, the overall cost over. Um, I take those working parts, I package them up, and then I have some number of processors that I can now take to market, sell, uh, you know, make a product, and everyone's happy. 
So you know, that's you know, kind of the you know, very simplified traditional view of you know, how we build you know, silicon chips or what we call a, a monolithic chip, a, a single die uh, product. So the idea with chiplets is you know, we start with the same silicon wafer, but instead of building a single monolithic chip, you know, through you know, some form of architectural uh, partitioning, we're going to take that design and decompose it into a larger number of smaller chips. So you know, what this may end up look like is you know, we have a bunch of these you know, little pieces in this uh, illustrative example. You know, maybe we have a design and we cut it into you know, uh, smaller pieces that each have one quarter of the original functionality. Now, you know, if you have, you know, that same technology node with kind of the same default, you know, density or you know, rate of uh, defects, what happens is that we'll have, you know, roughly the same number of uh, manufacturing, you know, issues as we had previously, but for each fault in this new uh, design, it's going to take out a smaller amount of silicate, right? Uh, in this case, we throw out one of these quarter size chips instead of a full size chip, which overall allows us to you know, make use of more of the total silicon in that, uh, that complete wafer. Once we've you know, done this, we've tested all these chips, we could find out you know, which ones work, which ones don't, and then take the individual chiplets and assemble them into you know, complete uh, you know, system on chips or you know, a system on a, a package. Uh, the result, if you, do, you know, play your cards right, is that you potentially get you know, more yielded processors for that same original uh, silicon chip. And you know, each of these you know, processor products you know, has the same functionality uh, nominally as that you know, hypothetical monolithic design that you, you know, ideally would have uh, perhaps wanted to build, but you know, didn't yield well if you were to build uh, as a single day um, implementation. So, why does this work? And you know, basically what it comes down to is that the cost of a silicon die is nonlinear with respect to the die area. You know, if I double the die size, the cost of the silicon doesn't double, it actually more than doubles. Uh, likewise, if I cut it in half, the die size, um, the, the die cost uh, may be less than half. So I can take a design with say, you know, area X, build it as two chips with, you know, area X divided by two, and the total cost will actually be less of you know, those two smaller parts. It's not entirely free, you know, things don't partition uh, you know, perfectly and you know, there are some overheads and some costs with trying to chipotize a silicon design. So you know, uh, one uh, immediate uh, overhead that comes to mind is that you know, now that I've taken what used to be a single piece of, sil of silicon and broken it into two or more pieces, they still have to talk to each other if they're going to function as a single logical processor. And so we're going to require some additional uh, area, power, you know, other costs to implement some form of you know, chip to chip communication interface. Uh, there's going to be other types of overheads that are going to have to be, you know, paid for on a per die basis. So this could be, you know, test, debug, scan type of things where, you know, every one of these chips has to support that because I have to, you know, do no good die testing. There's other, you know, system level type of capabilities, clocking, power management, uh, et cetera. And so as a result, once you, you know, put all these things in, you actually end up with a, you know, total silicon cost of, you know, you'll end up using more silicon than that monolithic design, right? In, in this case, the area of two chiplets is greater than the area of a single monolithic chiplet. And so, you know, at some level that sounds, you know, perhaps not as good. I'm trying, you know, ultimately we want to make the best use of our silicon and we're actually using more silicon to achieve, you know, that same original functionality. But again, this works out because of that nonlinear cost function, right? That you know, even though this is a little bit more total silicon, the cost of these individual chiplets is significantly cheaper. That the you know the aggregate of these chiplets uh, still provides a net win. You know, and again, outside of the silicon cost, there's other uh, overheads that come in terms of the overall you know process, and we still have to you know spend additional design effort to figure out you know what's the right way to partition. Uh, a given system, right? For a given uh, SOC, a given processor design, there's you know just a combinatorial number of ways one could slice and dice uh, that design. 
and you know, one has to do the actual partitioning, you know, the physical design, all of these things to make sure that the partition design you know, works as intended. So there's a, a variety of overheads, and you know, the, the chiplet chiplization does not come you know, entirely for free. And you know, this also makes sense, right? Because you know, if the chiplization was free, then you know, asymptotically, you know, one would come up with a you know the absurd res uh, result of trying to advocate for an infinite number of infinitesimally small uh, pieces of silicon, right? That's you know, not going to uh, work out intuitively. So that gives a, a very high level, you know, uh, concept of you know what we're trying to do with chiplets, and then you know to kind of make it a little more real, we'll walk through a couple uh, case studies of you know how AMD you know took this approach, and you know why you know kind of you know why we did this, you know why is this the right time to do it? And we'll start with our uh, Epic uh, processors, which you know address the, the the server enterprise high performance computing space. So you know, at the time we were looking at you know the first generation AMD uh, Epic processors, you know from our our market analysis and you know the products requirements, you know to what we determined was going to be a, a competitive part was you know something that was able to deliver you know 32 uh, CPU cores, eight channels of DDR and a large amount of I/O as well. We were targeting 128 lanes of uh, PCIe uh, I/O. And, you know, because you know, the way we've always done things is we build a single monolithic chip, the first uh, you know, analysis was, okay, well, this is what, you know, the, the product requirements uh, specify, what would it take to build this in a traditional fashion? And so our projections basically came out that, you know, to do this in a, you know, 14 nanometer uh, process node, which is, you know, where we were at the time, it would require a chip that was, you know, nearly 800 square millimeters in size. Uh, this is something that's you know technically feasible. It's something that you know could be built, but the cost models, you know, the the yields, and everything else for such a large ship would have put this uh, part to be in a very you know economically uncompetitive uh, position. Um, that this is you know now getting up close to the reticle limit, and so the you know just the the, the manufacturability of this would, would have been quite challenging. And you know, so this is what you know initially pushed us toward thinking about you know taking a system and breaking it up into smaller pieces, as you know, qualitatively discussed earlier. So, what we did in this you know first generation is that you know instead of you know thirty two core monolithic system, we built individual chiplets that were uh, you know, provided eight cores each. And you know, once you put in you know all of the other uh, components, you know, we kind of divided up the memory controllers and the uh, I/O interfaces, um, you know, evenly so that you know, each of these chiplets uh, had a quarter of you know what we wanted for the complete system. We ended up with a chiplet that was 213 square millimeters in size. Now, when you put four of these together, that adds up to 852 square millimeters of total silicon, which you know compared to the prior slide of uh, the monolithic design you know, was actually 10% larger uh, in, total, in terms of total silicon area, right? And so this is, you know, it gets back to that, that previous point that you know, there are overheads. We have to add these, uh, you know, those, the blue infinity symbols uh, represent the chip to chip interfaces for what we call our infinity fabric. Um, and there's you know, other uh, overheads uh, that come, come about, right? When it gives you a, a order of magnitude, you know, we're talking about 10% you know, overhead to take a monolithic system and partition it into uh, a bunch of smaller pieces. However, you know, despite using 10% more silicon to implement you know, that original 32 core functionality, the yield benefit of having these smaller chips that you know, uh, are just easier to manufacture, uh, you know, our analysis you know, at the time showed that it would actually be about 40% uh, less total cost to put this all together. And so, you know, that was, you know, really powerful for us in terms of, you know, how do we, you know, meet the product specifications that, you know, were, you know, you know quite ag aggressive uh, at the time, um, but, you know, do it within the confines of, you know, the silicon constraints that, you know, the cost and the capabilities. So, you know, this was, you know, kind of our, our first foray into, uh, you know, kind of our, our modern you know, chiplet strategy or our modern chiplet approach. Um, and you know, there were you know, pros and cons with this, but you know, what I'll talk about next is you know, kind of how, you know, how we evolved that and you know, uh, you know, how we you know, did things smarter for the second generation. 
so you know kind of you know after that first generation of uh, the epic processors you know the the timing was such that seven nanometer was starting to come online and you know working with the foundry partners and you know, our own analysis uh, you know we characterized the technology capabilities as you know providing us with approximately a 2x device density right so that if it goes 14 to 7 the same product uh, we should be able to get you know twice the capabilities uh, you know approximately speaking um the device you know characteristics are also better in seven nanometers so you know we're projecting you know for the same power we get about a 25 percent uh performance improvement or the other way around if you kept performance flat uh we can actually reduce power by about uh 50 percent um what's also you know what was really exciting for us is that you know in the first generation we had a 32 core uh, compo uh processor and with you know a doubling of device density you know, at least on paper, that uh, would suggest that a 64 core, you know, product would be, you know, within the realm of possibility. So the first thing we did was we started with, you know, our first generation uh, Epic design, and we looked at, okay, well, let's take this and just port it to seven nanometers, right? If it worked before, maybe it'll work again. And then, you know, certainly uh, from a design perspective, you know, simple is better. Don't want to reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. Uh, the challenge was that you know, when we look at the components of one of these uh, chiplets from the first generation uh, Epic design, we find that there is a, you know, a, a distribution of different types of functionality. So in particular, you know, the, the core parts, the, the CPU cores, the L3 cache, right? this is your traditional logic. This is the part of the chip that will really benefit from uh, seven nanometer scaling. So that you know, this will uh, reduce an area, you know, this is where you'll get that 2X device density improvement. However, in the remaining parts of the chip, we have a lot of you know, other components, uh, the memory interfaces and the IO interfaces. You know, these uh, are either components with a lot of uh, analog functionality, or in some cases the IO, they're limited by the uh, the, the bump, the, the pinout requirements to escape to the rest of the package. And so what happens for these components when you go to seven nanometer is that their sizes hardly change at all. all right. And so ideally, if I took this 14 nanometer chip, put it in seven nanometers, it would take you know, perhaps you know, half the area. However, in practice, you know, only this, you know, the core and L3 part of it you know, really gets that, that benefit. And so instead of a 50% reduction in chip area, we're only seeing you know, about a, a quarter uh, reduction. And then when you combine that with you know, the cost you know, curve that we we're talking about earlier, you know, that you know, puts this, uh, the first generation Epic approach, uh, you know, it's, it's just not uh, as effective when you now add on the constraints of what seven nanometer uh, you know, is, is costing us. So we had to, you know, kind of go back to the drawing board and rethink how we organize our processors to, you know, to take advantage of the technical capabilities of, you know, seven, seven nanometer silicon, but also find a way to deal with uh, the cost implications of it. So what we did is we ended up refactoring the way we organize a chip, and it's in retrospect perhaps a, a fairly simple observation, but you know, it turned out to be pretty powerful, right? If seven nanometer is really effective for the cores and the uh, L3 caches, and it's not a cost-effective way to build, you know, the analog and IO components, well, let's simply use seven nanometer where it helps and don't use it where it doesn't help, right? So it's kind of kind of a simple observation in retrospect, but you know, this was a, a change in in thinking and the way we approach things. All right, so in the second uh, generation Epic processor, we ended up using a, uh, a mature uh, 12 nanometer uh, process node to build what we call an IO die. And so we centralize you know, uh, all eight channels of uh, DDR you know, interfaces, FIs, and controllers. We have all of our you know, PCIe IO connections, and then we have our Infinity Fabric links that connect the individual uh, core chiplets, the CPU core chiplets, back into the IO die. Now, if we take a look at this new design, you know this is you know pretty much accomplishing what we set out to do. You know by removing all of the IO, the memory, etc., from what we call the CCD or the, the core complex dies, 
we've now, you know, basically the majority of this triplet area is dedicated to the CPU processors, you know, to the caches, right? There's a, a small amount of remaining, um, you know, peripheral uh, circuitry, the, you know, basically for the Infinity Fabric interface, right? This provides the interconnect uh, from the CCD, the core complex die back to the IO die. But apart from you know this sliver, which you know occupies approximately fourteen percent of the chip, you know everything else is basically you know functionality that really benefits from that move to seven nanometers, All right? And then you know when we move to seven nanometers, the size of these chiplets you know uh, uh, shrinks, right? Because it's still in an eight core, um, you know, eight cores per chiplet. And that reduction in chip size, you know, basically allows us to pack eight of these CCDs into a single, you know, package. And this is what, you know, enables us to get to a 64 core design, All right? So this was something that, um, you know, uh, you know, just a, a big step that allowed us to have a, a massive improvement in capabilities from our, our first generation to second generation, um, you know, server offerings. So I'll talk a little bit briefly, you know, about, you know, some of the challenges and, you know, the work that had to be done, you know, on, you know, kind of at, at the PowerPoint level, it's kind of easy to just, you know, draw a bunch of rectangles, draw a bunch of smaller rectangles and show that they all fit together, right? But, you know, delivering a real product is certainly much more than uh, colorful rectangles uh, in Microsoft Office. And so, you know, one of the, uh, you know, one of the ways that we had to you know, kind of innovate and work together, you know, across the company is that, you know, we really had to cross a lot of different functional boundaries. And you know, one example I'll talk about here is the, the important role of, you know, silicon and packaging co-design. So, you know, if we look at the, you know, the package level layout for the second generation um, Epic processor, you know, the IO die you know, sits in the middle. There's um, you know, some amount of routing to get the PCIe you know, out the north and south ends of the chip. There's a lot of routing going out to the east and west for our eight DDR channels. And that doesn't leave a lot of space left to actually connect from the IO dies to the individual CPU chiplets. And to make this work, you know, uh, what one of the problems is that with the original first generation Epic design, you know, a, a lot of the package uh, resources were you know, already utilized. And furthermore, we are providing uh, socket compatibility so that our customers can, you know, take out the, the first generation Epic processor, put in a second generation processor, and, you know, they're off to the races with uh, new capabilities without having to, you know, refresh their entire infrastructure. All right. And so, having to, you know, sort of live within the same package footprint, put a lot of uh, pressure, a lot of challenges on how we, um, you know, if we're trying to put together the second generation solution. What we ended up having to do is to effectively route some of these signals underneath the CCD, um, which was, you know, very disruptive compared to how we did it in, in the first generation. I'll, I'll walk through that in the following slide here. So this, Figure here shows, you know, uh, a cartoon representation of our power delivery for the first generation uh, Epic processor, and in particular, what we have, you know, for the the L3 cache, uh, the L3 cache is driven by one of the power rails uh, called VDDM, and there are a couple of uh, on-chip uh, voltage regulators, LDO, the LDOs, uh, the low dropout regulators, and so you know, these uh, provide the power for the L3. Uh, you know, but there are some fairly large physical distances to you know, deliver that power, deliver the current over. And so what we actually do is what we call a, a power, uh, sorry, a package assisted uh, power delivery, where these, uh, these LDO regulators drive the power down to the package level metal. Uh, you know, these are you know, very thick, low resistance uh, metal layers that allow us to you know, get a, a good clean power delivery. Uh, this comes back up through the RDL, which is the redistribution layers, and back to the L3, right? And so this is the way we did it in the first generation. The problem was that, you know, if you look at the previous uh, slide here, what we want to do now is to route these signals, uh, these infinity fabric signals, you know, directly under the, um, the, the chiplet. Um, but that, unfortunately, is exact, exactly where this you know, this red uh, power redistribution layer is on the, using the package metal routes. 
So what we had to do was, you know, we had to work together both from the packaging and the silicon design teams, you know, in a, a carefully, you know, chore choreographed, uh, you know, dance here is that we had to, you know, complete, not completely, but, you know, modify the layout of the L3, you know, at the silicon level in terms of, you know, where we put the, uh, the LDOs and, you know, how they're laid out. And then we're able to, you know, drop these down and use the RDL layers instead. The challenge of RDL layers is, you know, these are significantly more resistive. And so if we had to drive the current through the same distance as in the first generation layout, uh, you know, the, the, the power delivery, um, you know, would not be as robust, you know, the, the voltage drop would have been uh, too large to handle. However, by, you know, repartitioning the, the LDO, uh, you know, topology in this fashion, you know, the LDO can manage to drive the power, you know, effectively a short distance, uh, you know, laterally, and, you know, we kept it within a small enough uh, distance that the, the, the total IR drop was, you know, kind of within our specs and allowed the, the part to work, uh, you know, as intended. Uh, the result then is that that frees up the the metal layers on the package so that we can you know feed those infinity fabric uh, signals you know through you know from the IO die to those those far side uh, CCDs. And so you know this is just you know one illustrative example how you know the the whole notion of taking a design and trying to partition it into a bunch of smaller pieces, it's it's simply more than saying that you know a CPU core goes here, a memory controller goes there, but you know, there's a lot of uh, interactions uh, in terms of the, the, the physical organization and how this all comes together. All right. So just, you know, a, a quick summary as to, you know, how, how this all comes together, right? Um, you know, this chart uh, shows a, a normalized uh, die cost of if we have our, uh, the, the blue bars that are, you know, effectively our Chiplet approach. It's a, uh, a seven nanometer, uh, some you know, a multiple number of uh, these seven nanometer CCDs and CPU chiplets plus a uh, twelve nanometer IO die, and it's normalized to the sixty-four core case, right? So it's one IO die with eight CCDs. The red bars show what the corresponding cost would be had we built this, you know, in a seven nanometer process as a single monolithic chip. And you know, it, it's, you know, a couple of things kind of pop out directly from this plot. Um, you know, first is that, you know, even for our 64 core, you know, biggest configuration, that actually ends up being cheaper than if you were to try to build a 16 core monolithic chip in seven nanometers, right? So you're getting four times the number of cores um, with, you know, a significantly lower cost. You know, another uh, you know, really nice aspect of this is that, you know, the, the cost curve here is, you know, effectively, you know, more or less linear that, you know, there's a cost for the IO die, a cost for the packaging. And then after that, we can simply change the number of CCDs um, to enable more cores, fewer cores, et, et cetera. And then, you know, um, it, it's not a typo here, but there is this uh, uh, what appears to be a, a missing bar at 64 cores. And the reason that's the case is that if we were to try to build a 64 core monolithic chip that would have required over a thousand square millimeters of silicon, right? So that exceeds the lithographic you know, radical limit. And it's you know, effectively just you know, would be uh, unmanufacturable, right? So kind of another really cool aspect of chiplets is that even though each chip you know, still has to be imaged within the lithographic field, you can take a composition of them to create a system that you know, uh, exceeds that reticle limit, right? This is effectively uh, more than one reticle's worth of silicon in a single solution. Another you know, nice you know, aspect of this design approach is that you know, we basically have only two tape outs, right? There's one tape out for the central IO die and there's one tape out for the CCD. And with just these two tape outs, we're able to you know, deliver products uh, covering you know, the entire you know, server stack here. Uh, compared to a traditional you know, monolithic approach, you know, if I wanted to offer uh, products with you know, 64 cores, 48 cores, 3D cores, so on and so forth, I would you know, have to do multiple tape outs for you know, those different size uh, parts. And you know, that's just you know, a lot more expense in terms of engineering, physical design, verification, you know, bring up you know, inventory management, all, all kinds of things uh, come up. And you know, instead with just two designs here, I'm mean, sorry, with just two tape outs, you know, we have the whole space covered. Uh, another you know, powerful aspect of this approach is that 
we, you know, across the entire product stack from 64 cores all the way down to 16 cores, we have the same IO die, which means we provide the you know, complete complement of eight memory channels, 128 lanes of PCIe. And so there's no compromising on in terms of the, the system or the platform capabilities. And you know, for a lot of our, uh, you know, for, I say for, for some customers in some segments, that was a really compelling uh, you know, value proposition. Uh, as an example, things like you know, storage and IO centric uh, applications, they have you know, uh, very demanding IO requirements. And so you know, the 128 lanes of PCIe was really valuable, but you know, storage isn't you know, the fastest thing in the world. And so you don't need 64 cores to keep all of your IO saturated, all of it busy. And so in this case, you know, you can buy something with, you know, maybe 16 or 24 cores, and that'll be you know, more than enough to do, you know, what it is that customer wants. Uh, and, you know, we don't force them to have to pay for, you know, 64 cores just to be able to get, you know, more memory channels or more uh, PCIe. Um, but, you know, if this was a monolithic design, you know, it might be a lot more difficult to justify a design point that had you know, 16 cores, but you know, all, all of this uh, IO and everything else, the, the cost and everything else will come out in, in a much you know, stranger spot. You know, going from the, the first generation to the second generation, there were a couple additional advantages that, you know, that we found. Uh, you know, the first generation part had you know, these four identical chiplets and you know, each chiplet had two DDR memory channels. What this created was, you know, a bit of a you know non-uniform memory access uh, scenario where you know if this core here wanted to access you know memory that was on one of these memory channels, it would you know basically be a request on that same chip, and this would be you know, relatively quick, you know, about ninety nanoseconds. However, if you wanted to access memory that was you know uh, hosted on one of these other chiplets, then you'd have to go through one of these Infinity Fabric links. Uh, and then you know, access the memory controllers, get out the memory, and then come back. And so that adds you know, uh, additional latency and you know, uh, you know, non-trivial latency for those remote requests. We're talking about, uh, you know, about a 50 nanosecond difference. In the second generation, you know, because we have this IO die with all of the memory controllers you know, on the same chip, it you know, significantly reduced the, the NUMA aspects of the overall design. And so you know, on one hand, one might think that, well, the local memory is gonna suffer, right? Because whether it's, um, you know, it, it doesn't matter where the memory controller is, I have to go through one of these infinity fabric hops to get from the CCD to the IO die, all right? There is no uh, you know, truly local same chip memory access anymore. However, you know, it's, you know, with a, a lot of engineering uh, and, and other improvements, the, the, the latency to access, you know, kind of this, this nearest memory controller was only about four nanoseconds uh, worse than the, the local memory access in the first generation design. Uh, you know, once you get you know, across this infinity fabric link onto the IO die, then we have you know, very high bandwidth, high performance uh, data fabric, or you know, often known as a network on chip that can get you across to any of the other memory controllers. And you know, once you do that, you know, the worst case, uh, memory latency, you know, if you had to go across to the opposite corner, is about 114 nanoseconds. And you know, what we end up seeing is that you know, in the previous first generation design, you know, I mentioned that the, you know, the difference between the best case and the worst case memory latency was about 50 nanoseconds. In the second generation, it's you know, down to 20 nanoseconds. So that you know, significantly reduces you know, the, the scale of the, the numinous of the system. And you know, for a lot of uh, our, our customers, you know, the, the 20 nanoseconds difference was close enough that you know, they can just treat this effectively as a, a uniform memory access system and, you know, not expose uh, the additional you know, software programming, uh, you know, management complexities uh, to the programmers. Uh, and certainly, you know, if you do have, you know, if those 20 nanoseconds still, you know, do matter to you, you know, we do have support where you can, you know, localize your accesses so that, you know, you do get uh, the fastest possible latency. Okay, so yeah, you know, that was you know the, the story of you know how, how we took chiplets and applied it to the server market, right? But you know AMD uh, plays in a lot of areas uh, outside just you know server enterprise and HPC. So uh, I'll talk very briefly about you know how we took this general approach and extended it into a, a couple other uh, target markets. So you know if you look at the 
uh, the Epic, you know, server processor, you know, one aspect of it is that, you know, it's got, you know, tons of memory controllers, tons of IO, which, you know, would be an overkill for your client and, you know, a consumer uh, type of products, you know, no one that I know of, you know, has a laptop with, you know, eight uh, memory channels, um, you know, maybe some in this crowd would, uh, would like that. Uh, but for you know, most folks, that's uh, just, you know, more, more than anyone's uh, going to need at this point in time. So what we did was we, you know, leveraged the silicon design of the CCDs and we, you know, leveraged the IP of the IO die, but, you know, we had to tape out a, a new chip, which we called the, the client IO die. And this is effectively a quarter size version, a quarter size cut down of the server's IO die. It has, you know, uh, two memory channels instead of uh, four, it you know, basically has a quarter of the IO and it has, you know, this, uh, the same two uh, infinity fabric links to connect out to the CCD. And that you know, this allows us to you know, basically you know, reuse uh, the, the silicon, the engineering, et cetera, for the CCDs that you know, we've you know, put a lot of investment into for the server side. Uh, and you know, uh, even though it's new silicon for this client IO die, it's uh, just a huge amount of uh, IP leverage, IP reuse that you know, allowed us to you know, spin this uh, quite quickly, quite effectively. Uh, and then, you know, again, with this you know, modular chiplet approach, this still allowed us to build um, you know, client parts that were up to 16 cores, which you know, at the time was you know, sort of uh, you know, breaking new ground for the capabilities in this space. You know, the overall you know, cost benefits, you know, it's, a, it's a similar story as we had with the, the Epic processors. Uh, the scale or the magnitude of the, the deltas you know, perhaps you know, isn't as large, which is uh, just a reflection of the, the die sizes, right? You know, for a really big uh, you know, 32 or 64 core you know, type of system, uh, the, uh, you know, because of the nonlinear uh, cost with respect to die area, you know, if building such a big chip, uh, you know, becomes so much more expensive, and the power of chipization uh, of that design, you know, provides you know bigger benefits. If you start with a, a moderate to smaller size chip, uh, you know, chipization still helps, but you know, you don't get that same you know massive massive uh, benefit. Um, you no, know, it, it's still quite you know, significant in the sixteen core case, uh, the eighteen core case. You know, it isn't as big, but that's you know, that's still uh, real real cost savings. Yeah, you know, to take this a little bit further, it's you know it's also um, interesting in that you know you know it kind of mentioned that the server you know I/O and memory capabilities you know is an overkill for the client space, but you know the client space is not a single monolithic uh, market. You know, in particular for the enthusiast uh, high-end type of space, uh, they often require additional chipsets to provide you know, extra capabilities, additional I/O lanes, additional uh, SATA connections, things of that sort. So. A you know, kind of further innovation we had was we were actually able to take the client IO die and you know, basically take that same exact silicon and you know, with some you know, reconfiguration, different packaging, et cetera, basically use that directly as our chipset for our, our uh, client parts. And so you know, this is uh, quite nice because we can actually take these client IO dies that you know, maybe there was a defect, a uh, manufacturing defect in the DDR interfaces or the, uh, the Infinity Fabric interfaces. And normally, if we are only using this for the purposes of putting together these uh, Ryzen processors, uh, those defects would render this uh, chip you know, uh, you know, not, not usable, we'd have to throw it out. In this case, we're able to harvest the silicon and repurpose it for uh, this, um, you know, this chipset uh, capability, right? And this is something that you know, we had to develop anyway, right? That, you know, there's a, a platform, a market need to provide chipsets. Uh, and so, you know, with the same single design, we're able to you know, reuse this, uh, this silicon with, you know, different configuration, different packaging uh, to you know, address a need as well as to you know, find a way to, uh, you know, save costs by you know, reusing what would otherwise have been discarded silicon, right? So this was just, you know, a great you know, way to you know, align your design to target multiple needs uh, all in one. Another quick example of you know how we can use you know silicon, you know, reuse silicon uh, combined with you know customized uh, packaging. Um, the figure on the left shows our uh, our first generation Epic processor, and you know at the time you know we're getting you know some you know market data and you know other information that was suggesting that you know there was a opportunity for you know very very high end very uh, capable uh, desktop systems and, and workstations. 
And you know, this was you know sort of the, the birth of what we call the our, our thread wrapper uh, line of processors. And what we did in the first generation Threadripper was, you know, we basically took the same basic, uh, you know, silicon building blocks, and with you know custom packaging, what we did was we took you know two of these, uh, you know, Epic processor uh, dies. Uh, the other spots we replaced with uh, dummy silicon just to maintain the you know, kind of the, the mechanical integrity of the overall packaging. We had to run a new. Uh, you know, package substrate, which had a, a different uh, set of IOs and you know, memory interfaces, you know, that matched uh, this new set of uh, capabilities. But again, by reusing that same silicon with some creative uh, package redesign, we're able to you know, basically create an entire new product line that uh, you know, addressed this emerging market opportunity. So, you know, by having these uh, modular silicon components combined with you know, uh, a very kind of agile way to you know, recombine and repurpose them that allows, uh, you know, allows us to be very uh, responsive to you know, different changes and opportunities in the market. So to wrap things up, we'll leave a, a little bit of time for uh, some questions and answers. You know, this is, uh, I think, you know, a really exciting and, you know, powerful way to uh, approach, you know, chip design. And, you know, especially for a company like AMD, it's not about, you know, designing a single product, but we have multiple products covering multiple product families. And, you know, because of the way we've, you know, approached the, the modular construction of our SOCs, you know, with just, you know, these two tape outs, we're able to address a wide range of different products, uh, you know, with the, the server parts. Uh, and we also have, you know, I didn't have time to talk about it. We, we do similar, you know, silicon and package, you know, customization to also address the embedded market. Um, you know, again, we're able to address this, uh, the high-end desktop uh, market as well, using the same silicon with you know, the IP reuse and the client IO die, we're able to extend that you know, uh, very effectively into you know, the consumer market uh, in a variety of different ways. So if you, you know, want some additional detail about you know, more of the thinking, more of the rationale, some of the additional trade-offs, some of the paths not taken, uh, you know, we, we did publish a paper uh, with uh, a lot of information uh, this past summer at the, uh, the ISCA conference. So, you know, I invite uh, any of you who are interested in uh, taking a look at that to, to get a little more information. But, you know, you've got me here on the line right now, so I'm happy to uh, take some questions. We've got, I guess, about 10 minutes or so. Yeah, it was a great talk, Gabe, and uh, there are a bunch of questions on the, that were written, so I'm going to go through those first, uh, possibly synthesize them a bit, and then we'll open up for the audience. And I guess, uh, given that we have about 100 participants, I would appreciate if you could like raise your hand using Zoom so I can go select uh, some if you want to speak. But let's go to the written question first. Um, the first one is, how does the chiplet, chiplet latency, I guess propagation delay, affect the overall processor performance. I know you, you mentioned about some of the kind of individual latency, but I guess this is sort of the effect on the overall performance, if you can say, of course. Yeah, the uh, the latency, you know, it, it's it's non-zero, it's it's not free. Um, and, and so there there is uh, an impact on you know performance compared to a, a hypothetical you know monolithic uh, chip. Um, however, you know, especially for the, the server sized um, processors, there's uh, still a, a fair, you know, a non non trivial amount of latency is also in you know getting from yeah you know, from the time you issue like a load instruction, you have to get through the L1 cache, the L2 cache, the L3 cache, right? At that point, you know, if you miss, you will go through this uh, chip to chip latency, um, and then you know you hit you know for example the I/O die, you have to go across our our network on chip or the data fabric. You have to go to the memory controller, get scheduled, worry about bank conflicts and all everything else. You finally get the result back and you, you know, then rewind the entire path. And so, you know, there are a, a few nanoseconds of additional latency from uh, the chip to chip interfaces, but it's still, you know, a, a fraction of the total load to use latency. Uh, and so, you know, it, again, it's going to depend on, you know, particular workloads and, you know, workload sensitivity latency, but, you know, it's, um, you know, I, I, yeah, you know, I'd say it's probably you know you know maybe maybe a, a percent you know uh, uh, performance you know um, in, in typical cases actually I think it might even be a little bit less. Interesting. <clears throat> so second question is on sort of the um, how do you ensure how do you test the chiplets to ensure they're like non-good dies or non-good chiplets and you know it's kind of a corollary to that is 
you know, what, what, what kind of packaging yield loss once you start combining a lot of more stuff are you kind of experienced or willing to, to tolerate and sort of, it's, it's about, you know, the testing of the, the individual chiplets, right? Yep. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So uh, it, it's definitely something that we, we designed in from, from the get-go that, you know, we, we, we put a, uh, we've put a lot of uh, engineering innovation into, you know, how to get, uh, it, it's not just good test coverage, but also fast test coverage, right? Uh, test throughput is important uh, because, you know, there is only so much testing equipment uh, on the fab line. And so, you know, if you needed to uh, if you need to run your tests longer to get you know the, the coverage that you need that can actually uh impact you know how many chips you know per unit time you can uh, push out the line and so there's a, a variety of, of different tests um and the, the the chips are built with you know uh and there's you know testing happens at, at multiple stages along the way right so there's some some kind of quick and dirty tests that we can do to you know, immediately decide that yeah this thing has no no chance of working this piece of silicon uh there's testing that will actually, you know, uh, you know, do things, you know, kind of at speed and uh, there is, you know, belt and self test type of approaches and, uh, you know, there's, there's tons of uh, established uh, techniques there. And then, you know, when you, um, you know, but, and, and there's also, it's not just functional tests, there's also performance testing, speed bidding, right? Because I don't want to take four chiplets where, you know, you know, two of them are fast, two of them are slow, and or, you know, worst case, three of them are fast, one of them are slow, and now I have to sell this as a overall slower, you know, frequency part, right? Because, you know, the, the, the total, you know, ha- uh, high speed is going to be lower. Uh, so, you know, we have to go through all these things to uh, do the functional tests and the speed bidding appropriately to, you know, get the right pieces together. Um, and, you know, that does, it's not just the testing, but it, you know, uh, introduces complexities in terms of the supply chain management, inventory management, et cetera, to, you know, whereas, you know, I used to just have, you know, uh, a, a chip and now it's kind of added a, a dimension of uh, how we manage all of this. Oh, we got a lot of questions. So let's see if we can go through a couple of them quickly. So why have chiplets shown up in CPUs before GPUs? Is there anything that, you know, makes them, you know, CPU kind of more amenable than the GPU to be broken up or? So, so part of it, and there's, you know, there's a variety of factors, but you know, one, one aspect is that the, uh, the GPU design, you know, just, you know, in general, not, not even specific to AMD, uh, there's a lot more, you know, parallelism, right? There's a, a lot more, uh, you know, threads of execution, a lot more uh, compute units. And as a result, it's actually, you know, somewhat easier to build a design where you can have you know, harvesting or, or sparing, right? I could, you know, build a design where I've got, you know, N compute units, where I'm just assuming that some number of them uh, may not pan out, you know, for manufacturing or whatever. And so, you know, if I've got, you know, like hundreds of compute units and, you know, one or two of them fail, you know, I'm only losing, you know, a, a fraction of a percent of my compute capability. You know, if I've got, you know, eight cores on a chip and one of them fails, you know, I've lost 12 and a half percent of my compute capability. And so the the GPU kind of redundancy and harvesting architectures, uh, are, I think are naturally more amenable to, you know, you know somewhat, you know, higher fault rates or, you know, effectively, you know, larger chip designs where you can recover, uh, more more gracefully. Well, let's go to a quick one, I guess. Uh, what's the state of the EDA tooling for your chiplet design across place and route verification, power and thermal, and were you happy with it? Um, certainly, there's constant innovation uh, going on there. Uh, you know, you know, each generation we're pushing the capabilities of the silicon, of the packaging, of the power delivery, of you know, of all of these things, uh, the clocking, the timing. Um, and so there's you know, there's constant innovation on on multiple fronts there. Um, you know, are we happy with it? I mean, there's you know things that always be better, right? You know, yeah, EDA is sort of you know it's just you know buckets and buckets of MP hard problems, right? So it, to, to some extent, no one will ever be you know, fully happy with it, or there's always uh, room for improvements. Um, but I guess you know suffice to say, uh, you know. It, what we had and what we were able to innovate were you know, sufficient uh, to get the job done. But certainly, you know, each generation it continues to get uh, more difficult. There's, you know, I think, a lot of opportunities for you know, further innovation there from the from the tool side. Right, this is a long question. I'm going to try to synthesize a little bit, and that is about uh, effectively 
you know, there's a lot of discussion out there. The the, the who asked the question uh, mentioned the talk from John Hennessy about you know special purpose versus general purpose uh, for future performance enhancement. So you know, how do you see this developing? Is the future more general purpose versus specialized chips, special or chiplet in this case, or a combination of both? In your case, it was still pretty general purpose, but I mean, would you see specialization kicking in basically? Yeah, I mean, you know, look, looking ahead, I, I think specialization is. Um likely to be inevitable, right? The question is how much and when, um, right? You know, if Moore's law, you know, slows down much further or just, you know, straight up, you know, comes to a stop and we need performance to continue uh, increasing, you know, you know, specialization acceleration is, you know, one of the, you know, big levers we, we still have remaining in our, our toolbox, right? You know, collectively as an industry, it's not, not an AMD specific statement. And so I, I definitely see that. And I think, you know, chiplet, uh, you know, chiplet based approaches, modular design will, will play a, a very important role in that, right? Because if I have to build a single, you know, monolithic chip that does my, my general purpose stuff, my specialized stuff and, you know, all the other things uh, that becomes, you know, uh, increasingly expensive. And, and the challenge with specialization is that you know, the more you specialize in general, the smaller your market becomes, right? Uh, if I want to address a large you know, range of different applications, then you know, it's, it's hard to be a general purpose accelerator, right? It's kind of an oxymoron. And so it, it kind of goes hand in hand. That's kind of a question of how much acceleration and when does it make sense, right? And so I think it's both a technology question. It's also uh, an economics, you know, uh, type of question that all has to be balanced out. But you know, the short of it is, you know, I, you know it, it will. I, I believe it will come. All right, I have one question that may be a very short answer. Would you like to comment on requirements for substrate between first and second generation Epic? And uh... No, it's probably a good answer, but um, yeah, I don't. I don't know if I have uh, much to, to say on that. I'm not. You no, know, I'm not a, a substrate uh, expert. You know, the, we. You know, we, we didn't make any. You know, massive changes in in the, in the first and second generation. It's you know the the technology is very similar, and uh, in terms of the, the overall, you know, the package substrate, um, there's. Uh, you know, you know, part of it is, you know, limited by the fact that, you know, we're actually, you know, re, you know having, you know, full socket compatibility. And so, you know, we, we can't drastically change things, um, you know, too much. Um, and so, yeah, but I think that's probably about all I can say. A uh, question from Dave Patterson is very interesting about, you know, do you see an option of a standard like chiplet catalog uh, pairing that would allow many parts to be configured without being an AMD on Intel? So it's basically horizontal versus vertical integration of chiplets. You know, do you see the emergence of an ecosystem where people could actually pick up stuff at catalog and then put them together? Or as you mentioned, I mean, there's a co-design aspect that kind of makes that impossible or even like, you know, testing and, and business. But yeah, no, that, that, yeah that, that's something that you know uh, many folks have been talking about for years. It's you know perhaps uh, viewed as sort of the the, the chiplet holy grail, where um, so long as it's kind of you know going back in time to you know when we we're all younger and you buy your uh, uh, your your different you know chip packages, your, your little dip packages, and you stick them on a breadboard, and you know you can just you know right. buy buy things from wherever you want, wire them up, and you, you know you've got your little uh, your little circuit of. Uh, you know, different, you know, 70 or 400, you know, bits and pieces. Um, LSI era. Yep. Uh, right. And, you know, ideally, right, one could do something, you know, philosophically, you know, analogous, right, where I just have, you know, my, my catalog of different chiplets and have them put together. Um, but there are, and so, you know, one, you know, do I see us, you know, as an industry headed that direction? I think that it's uh, probably likely at some point in time we will see you know some version of that. I, I do think there are a lot of challenges uh, to get there, um, and I think it's it's actually fantastic opportunities for for a lot of research. Um, you know, one is just you know if the, this kind of goes back to a previous comment, right? That the more general purpose you make it, the more generic it is. Uh, you know, the more overheads you're going to have, right? You know, for example, like you know, how wide should the interface be between, you know, uh, chiplets, right? Should there be a standard 64-bit interface? Well, what if I have a really high bandwidth, you know, application that really could use 128, 256 bits, um, right? Then it's, you know, that accelerator, whatever, may be artificially constrained by this, uh, this interface. On the other hand, if I make it to be, you know, full like 512 bits, I may have a different accelerator where that's a complete overkill and that now, you know, costs me extra area, power, design, whatever 
to have to conform to this the standardized interface. Um, you know, and you know, there are ways around that. You can you know, perhaps uh, define you know, different granularities of interfaces, but then that kind of complicates your you know your set of standards uh, around the chiplet ecosystem. Um, and that's just you know one example. You know, power delivery would be like another one, right? If I want to really just you know be able to you know pick and place these uh, chips and put them down. You know, do I need to have a standardized, you know, power and ground, you know, bump out, right? So that, you know, where <laughs> I actually get power from where I think I'm going to get power from uh, instead of just, you know, some random, you know, metal signals. Um, you know, some of these things may be, you know, uh, you know they, uh, these things, there's nothing fundamentally uh, preventing, you know, some definition of a standard or some way around that. Uh, but there is, you know, there's a lot of work to figure out, you know, what really makes sense, what's the right balance. Um, and then, you know, as, uh, you know, Paolo, you know, suggest, you know, like, yeah, how, how do you go about, you know, testing these things? You know, what are the security implications, right? If I just buy this chip from a, a third party, um, you know, it, you know, what if it's doing certain certain things it's not supposed to do? You know, whether it's malicious or just because you know it wasn't designed properly and you know there's a bug in it, and now that causes my right, the rest of my system uh, to not behave uh, correctly. Um, so I think there's just there's, there's just tons of you know work that would have to be done uh, to figure out, you know, a, a complete, you know, ecosystem. Um, but at, at the same time, you know, I think there's, there's value in that, right? Uh, you know, being able to do that just, you know, it, it enables so many, you know, new capabilities. It also goes along with the, the previous question about specialization, right? If we really want to be able to specialize more and more to get more performance in a post Moore's law uh, you know, environment, you know, collectively as industry, we have to find some way to enable that specialization. And, you know, this could be, you know, one, you know, promising uh, approach to that. Yeah, we're, we're a few minutes over time. So before Dan slaps me, um, I just, I guess, uh, Dan, do we have time for, I guess, one more question? Or I don't know what, you know, how, how tight we are on time. Yeah, no, no, we're good. Why, why don't you uh, ask all the questions and perhaps Gabe can make all sure- All the that... questions, there's like okay. 20 more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll go. I, 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 I'm, I'm happy to hang out for, for a little bit longer here. Okay, then let's go. Let's keep going. So then one, the next one's from Vivek is about uh, positive negative impacts or I guess opportunities on the softer side uh, between chiplets versus monolithic approaches. So to uh, a first order for us, um, there wasn't you know, any, I'd say that there weren't you know, major impacts from a, from a software perspective. The first generation Epic certainly for you know some of the higher performance uh, type of customers, you know um, some folks did want to customize or make their software uh, more NUMA aware. You know, given the the, the differences in, in memory latencies, if you're you know, talking to memory controllers on your own chiplet versus on a on a, uh, one of the other three chiplets from where your cores are. Um, in the the second generation, uh, many of the customers you know said that the the NUMA differences were small enough that you know it wasn't worth the, the software effort to try to you know, manage the the locality thread pinning and whatnot. Uh, but you know there still remain uh, some that uh, did want to do that. Um, and in the first generation in particular, it, you know, it was sort of there were additional complexities when you look at at a uh, node level. Uh, you know, for example, a a, a two socket. SMP, you know, symmetric multiprocessing system, you effectively now have three NUMA domains, right? You've got the local memory. Uh, if the core is talking to memory controller on its own chiplet, you've got the, you know, remote, but still in the same socket memory where I just, you know, go through, uh, I go to another chiplet in the same socket, but, you know, go to memory there. And then there's a socket to socket, you know, that third level of remote memory. And so we, we did get, you know, some pushback from uh, some customers in terms of the additional kind of NUMA complexity that came about from that. But, you know, for the most part, uh, you know, that was you know, largely addressed by, by the second and, you know, subsequent generation approaches. And, you know, it, what remains is just, you know, those people where those last few nanoseconds really matter, then they'll continue to manage that. All right, next uh, question from Didier. Uh, it's pretty interesting on the, you know, recent developments in Photonics Interconnect are very promising, you know, high bandwidth and so on. Uh, you know, do you see, uh, uh, I'm sorry, what, what kind of, uh, you know, challenges might affect the scalability? And, uh, you know, do you see Photonics playing a role in chiplets, I guess, you know, kind of a secondary question to that, would you see photonics coming on the package, you know, to, uh, you know, address some of the chip to chip or, or you know, even, uh, do you see any role of photonics and sort of interconnects into, into this play? 
Yeah, that's that's a great question, and you know the the rate of uh, improvement in those technologies has been you know a, a lot of fun to watch over the last you know several years, and I, I think there's uh, certainly uh, some very interesting uh, possibilities. Now, what, what's the right answer? I, I I don't know at this point in time, but you know the whole notion of you know photonic interconnect, low latency interconnect, you know has a, the possibility to you know kind of take chiplets to a, a whole new level, right? Uh, you know, right now, our, our chiplets are still kept within the same package because you know we, we want them to be able to talk to each other with low latency, high bandwidth, low energy per bit. Um, photonics could potentially you know, allow chips that are you know, now in entirely separate packages to talk to each other again with you know, high bandwidth, low latency, low energy per bit, right? And you know if um, you know if the, the photonic capabilities you know uh, mature to the point where they're you know commercially viable. Uh, yeah, that could open up a, a whole realm of really interesting possibilities for you know how we re-architect you know processors or you know systems overall. Um, but you know, with a lot of you know technologies, it's, it's one thing to show a a demonstration you know in a lab with a couple of chips. It's another thing to be able to produce you know millions upon millions of these reliably every time, such that you know you can really create a a full you know commercial you know product out of it. Um, and so. You know, I'm I'm excited to see where photonics goes. I think there's just there are tons of really fascinating possibilities uh, out there. You know, when is the right time? I don't know. All right, next question from Giuseppe Torellas on cash coherency. No, probably not a surprise. And uh, <laughs> does cash uh, coherence support uh, suffer as you break the design into chiplets? If so how? I mean, you probably kind of indirectly answer that with kind of the, the previous question on the overall performance loss, but maybe you got something to add about specific cash coherence. Yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't know if, you know, to what extent I can talk about our specific solutions, but it is you know, definitely uh, you know, part of our, our design and, you know, it's something that we do pay attention to in terms of how to, you know, minimize the amount of, you know, communications related to cache coherence among these different components, right? Because if I have, you know, you know, exactly as you're thinking, right? If I have a CPU core, a one chiplet that, you know, modifies a line, and there's a copy of that on an entirely different chiplet, right? Now I have to send, you know, multiple, I have to take multiple hops to get, you know, effectively invalidation to the other side, get acknowledgement back, or, you know, if it has, uh, the other you know, core has a modified copy. It has to write it back to memory, and I have to wait, you know, for everything uh, to be ordered correctly before I can proceed with my own uh, modification. Um, and so, you know, we do have a variety of uh, you know mechanisms and optimizations to to make sure that all of that flows, uh, you know, as efficiently as uh, we we reasonably can for the design. Um, but you know, I don't. Uh, you know, can't, can't go into you know, specific you know, details and solutions here. Okay. Uh, one very specific implementation question, which you may or may not be able to answer. On your the two tier Ryzen 500 chip uh, that was announced at Computex, are the two chips bonded face to face or face to back? Oh, for the, uh, the, the Ryzen 5000. The, the new Ryzen uh, you know, fee cash um, yeah. stuff. Um, I'm not 100% sure what we said about that. Uh, I would suggest uh, that you take a look at the packaging tutorial that was just given uh, this past Sunday at Hot Chips. Uh, there are slides and such there. I haven't had a chance. You know, I, I haven't actually, uh, I wasn't able to attend that, uh, that tutorial, but there was a, an AMD presentation on uh, our, our packaging solutions. Uh, the answer uh, may be there otherwise. Yep. Um, I'm not sure if I'm clear to talk about it or not. Uh, from Hironorika Zahara, um, data reuse on L3 would be very important, right? Uh, do you see roles of parallelizing compiler to improve locality optimization? I guess, you know, because you're breaking up your L3, so you're paying some uh, penalties, uh, you know, moving across. Well, well, I'll let you answer. Sure. I mean, I think there's always room for additional enhancements from, you know, compiler and software level uh, improvements and optimizations, right? I think um, it's, you know, what, one of the, the beauties of speed ups is that they're multiplicative, right? So, you know, everything that, you know, everyone that contributes something adds to the, the overall bottom line of, of performance. Uh, so, you know, I think there's definitely opportunities there. Uh, certainly, and the way we've organized it is that each of these uh, chiplets, so in, in the first uh, in the first two generations of the Epic processors, each set of four cores had their own shared L3. 
uh, starting in the third generation Epic processor, every you know set of eight cores shares the L3, um, and so you know that you know makes it so you don't have to block you know as aggressively. Um, and then, but you know certainly if you're talking about you know from um, you know, if you're having the data fit in one L3 versus the next L3, and if you're constantly you know having to access stuff on the other chiplets, and kind of gets back to uh, Giuseppe's question about coherency. You know, it's certain if you do that poorly, you know, there could potentially be some uh, performance implications of that. Uh, and so to the extent that the compiler, the software stack, you know, profiling or other uh, software mechanisms uh, can improve the locality so that, you know, you're hitting out of your own local L3 as much as possible, you know, that's, you know, only going to help, I think. A right, question on power. That's an interesting one. In the same technology node, you know, power might scale linearly well. Will definitely scale as the number number of cores and chiplets on a package increases, especially for HPC. What have cooling techniques and you envision being used? And you know, as system integrators that are putting together large systems, I definitely feel the pain uh, for this part. But uh, you know, basically, impact on power and the cooling approaches for these packages that are becoming really power hungry. Right? Yeah, it's, I mean, this is to some extent, you know, you know, maybe a little bit orthogonal to, to chiplets uh, overall, right? Whether it's, you know, monolithic or chiplets, you know, we're building systems with greater and greater capabilities and they're consuming more power, which means you're generating more heat. Um, and so, you know, and one might argue with the chipization, we're able to scale the, uh, the total, you know, components faster, right? Because then we were you know, able to get to 64 cores uh, in a relatively short amount of time, um, and you know, that certainly drives uh, power consumption. And so, you know, it, it's definitely you know one of the areas where we've uh, you know been working very carefully, and it's it, it, it's a tough balancing act, right? Because the um, you know the, the OEMs don't want to, and and the customers, you know, don't want to have to pay for you know exotic cooling solutions with you know extreme capabilities, right? That that adds cost both to the parts and in many cases to the overall infrastructure as well. Um, at the same time, you know, they want more performance, and so it is a you know a bit of a, a balancing act. And we you know we work closely with our, our various partners and trying to find that that right balance. You know what? You know how much power is reasonable for a given you know, server design or you know, whatever you know, product design. Um, and then of course, the, the constraints are also different between the server space and you know, the, the laptop space, right? At, at, you know, for the time being, you know, I don't know how to design uh, you know, liquid cooling for my laptop without you know, carrying a tank of water on my back, right? Um, and so you know, there's different constraints in different spaces. You know, kind of looking forward, what are you know, some of the technologies that uh, might be uh, enabling to take things further. Um, you know, I think that's a lot of that, you know, comes from the, the system integrators, some of the cloud providers, there's been a, a lot of interesting, you know, recent, uh, literature in some academic, um, you know, venue, you know, research conferences, uh, you know, even from industry folk on you know, different cooling solutions, you know, immersion cooling, multi-phase cooling solutions, so on and so forth. Um, so there's a lot of possibilities, but, you know, again, in terms of the commercial, viability right you now demonstrating that something's technically feasible is one thing showing that it you know it economically makes sense both for you know the manufacturers as well as the customers you know whether it's the, the purchase costs the installation costs the um the you know the, the total cost of ownership you know all of those things you know, have to make sense at the, the end of the day for you know one of these new technologies uh you know enable us all to get to that next step I think we have uh, exhausted the list of questions that were submitted. Um, I thought you said so, we had twenty. <laughs> uh, we, had, uh, we had, I think we had probably twenty that I list. I, list well, I think you might want, be at twenty more. <laughs> I can ask you one myself if you want, and that's uh, up to you. Uh, well, let me try, and maybe we can wrap the, uh, this up unless. Uh, somebody else has more question. So th there are companies like uh, I'm going to mention one, Cerebras, who have taken a you know complete opposite approach of what you're saying. So you advocate breaking things up. They go for full wafer scale uh, design, taking the whole wafer. Of course, you know building an redundancy so that you know they can yield full wafers. But is there something in the application domain that makes their approach particularly interesting, or because based on everything that you said in your very convincing presentation, it shouldn't work, right? So what 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 does you know wafer scale? What does is there anything to make full wafer scale work? You know, looking forward or some specific domains? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the um, yeah. I, 
I, I wouldn't uh, jump to conclusion to say that uh, waiver scale uh, doesn't work. Um, you know, it may not work for general purpose, right? But they're not trying to solve general purpose computing, right? So for you know specifically what they're doing, the the regularity of the compute structures, as well as the ability to have the uh, redundancy and repair at wafer scale, uh, you know, it does enable a particular solution, a particular architecture for their use case uh, you know, for machine learning uh, to be, you know, effective and deliver, you know, some very uh, impressive, uh, you know, compute per millimeter square, per, you know, compute per watt, etc. Um, now, if you're trying to take that same wafer scale and build, you know, uh, you know other types of, you know, more general purpose systems, you know, you're likely to, you know, end up in, the, in a different point on the optimization curve, right? You know, in particular, like the total memory capacity that they have, right, uh, is, uh, is is a challenge, right? They have, you know, a massive amounts of SRAM because you know, once you're at wafer scale, it's kind of hard to get, you know, a, a lot of memory in there. You know, a lot of these problems, uh, whether it's, it's chiplet, wafer scale, 3D stacking, you have a lot of fundamental challenges in terms of kind of, you know, area versus periphery, or in case of 3D stacking would be, you know, volume versus, you know, surface area. And, you know, uh, that that difference of, you know, n versus n squared or n squared versus n cubed, you know, asymptotically will break things at some point, right? Just, I can't get enough bits in or enough bits out. I can't get enough watts in, you know, uh, like if I have a 3D cube, right? If I grow that uh, forever, eventually I have a, you know, a cube's worth of transistors to power, but I only have, you know, a, a square, uh, you know, uh, worth of surface area to deliver power or remove heat, right? So, you know, a lot of these uh, things, you know, you can customize it for particular use cases, optimize it for particular, you know, applications and find a compelling solution. But when you try to take it, you know, more generically, you know, I think you, you run into these, you know, types of, you know, more fundamental challenges and problems. I, unless people have a question that they want to either write or even speak up if they want, uh, I guess uh, we're approaching the end of the talk. Dan, I'm going to pass yep, this back. We're done. Uh, thank you very much, Paolo and Gabe, uh, even more so. Thanks for the great presentation, great attendance. And uh, please send me the slides once uh, you're ready and also your recording. And thanks, everyone, uh, for attending. Okay. Great. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks a lot, everyone. Okay. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye, everyone.